Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a great week. And it is warm in Texas today, isn't it? But that's Texas. We will liable to be freezing tomorrow. Who knows? <laughs> it can happen. Well, I hope you're having a great week. And uh, uh, we just I just caught a glance, a glance of the new magazine that's coming out. And I hope you have a chance in, to be receiving that shortly. And uh, be looking forward to the Holy Day seasons that are coming up. We're going to have several events around the country as well, and those will be listed on the back of the magazine. I was just looking at that in my chair there at the back cover that lists all of those dates and for the Holy Day weekends, and uh, please uh, make note of those and hope you make plans to be at one, of, one or several of those. Alexander the Great's father was named Philip of Macedon. It was after his name that in 356 B.C., the city of Philippi was named. In Acts, the 16th chapter, Paul calls it the chief city among the, these parts of Macedon, Macedonia, I should say. It was a military colony with special privileges to its citizen, maybe not unlike a military base might have today. You know, they have certain privileges of being around such a, a big military complex. It is interesting that Paul uses terms like citizen or to conduct oneself as a citizen when speaking to the church that was located there. The city was the crossroads between Asia and Europe. If you look on a map today, you know where uh, Greece is. This was northern Greece in the Macedonia region. If you're going from Turkey or down in the Middle East going up to Europe, you would pass through this region of Philippi. There were nearby gold mines during those days, which contributed to the wealth and the prosperity of the city. And in the second century BC, the Romans actually reconstructed the east-west route. You can look at pictures today of those uh, hand-laid stone roads that were called, uh, this, this particular road was called Via Ignatia, and the only uh, reference that I could find to that word Ignatia, it was that it was a guy's name that actually started the construction on that road. And this was a road that Paul probably traveled when he left Philippi on his way to Thessalonica. In the New Testament, Paul writes a letter to Philippi. It's a short letter. And he wrote this letter most likely from Rome because in that letter he uses, uh, he mentions the fact that he's a prisoner for one, and secondly, that he had received visitor. He was allowed visitors to enter his, where he was under, you know, in bonds, as he calls it, in chains. So he had some liberality. But he also mentions that there was those of the household of Caesar who had accepted the gospel message. Unbelievable, wouldn't you say? Those of the household of Caesar that had received the gospel message. And he also mentioned that there were others who had received uh, the gospel message during his day as a prisoner. All of this is evidence that suits the fact that he was in Rome when he wrote this letter to Philippi. Some will disagree with that, but when you look at the internal evidence. He addresses the letter to all the saints at Philippi. Paul is in his second, uh, Paul, I should say, on his second missionary journey, established the church there in about 50 A.D. He was, uh, it was his second trip. He made a little bit wider trip on his second missionary journey, and he went to Philippi. It was Paul's first act in, on European soil. In Acts the 16th chapter, we find that his visit was brief there. And if you read that story through Acts the 16th chapter, you'll find out that he wasn't there without a little bit of... Uh, abuse and punishment. You remember what happened there. You know, he found the, you know, he, he came into town. He found a group of people down by the river praying. He ran into Lydia, the, the seller of purple, and they became friends. She was devoted and she was baptized along, it tells us, with her whole household. Remember, that was the place where Paul delivered the demon-possessed girl from her affliction you know she was coming up behind them and saying this is Paul that preaches the kingdom of God and finally he just turned around and said in the name of Jesus Christ I command you to leave her and he did and she and so this girl 
who had been making a living for somebody in the city was all, all of a sudden normal. Paul delivered her, and of course the townspeople had an uproar, and they beat them, Paul and Silas, and cast them into prison. And you remember that time when he was in prison during that stay at Philippi, that the, the, the doors miraculously opened and the guard was going to kill himself, and Paul said, no, we're still in here. And so that guard came and said, what can I do to be saved? And of course Paul preached to him the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And this, this guard was actually converted and he, him and his whole house were baptized. This letter also mentions Epaphroditus. It mentions Eodius and Seneca, Clement, an unnamed friend. It mentions fellow laborers. And in the first verse here, it'll mention uh, bishops and deacons. So this group had begun to grow from their little fledgling beginning along that riverbank with only maybe Lydia and a few others there that were converted, it began to grow into a church. Five years later, five years goes by, Paul would visit Philippi again on his third missionary journey, and you read that in the book of Acts as well, where he spent the, uh, the days of unleavened bread there with them, and when he departed, remember, he was on his way to Jerusalem. In Acts the twentieth chapter, they sort you know remember they tried to convince him not to go to Jerusalem. We know that when he was in Jerusalem, when he did eventually arrive in Jerusalem, that he was eventually arrested. He spent some time imprisoned in Caesarea, uh, where he appealed to Caesar. We know that he made that long arduous journey all the way to Rome, where he you know was under house arrest for uh, several years, and some estimate that this was ten years from the time that he originally established the church at Philippi, that he wrote the letter to the Philippians. A lot can happen in 10 years, can't it? To a small church, a small group. And so he pens this letter. The Philippians, on the other hand, the people that were there in Philippi, heard of his imprisonment, and they sent him gifts of money and probably a little care package to tell him that they were concerned about him. And they sent this care package by Epaphroditus, who was a man or a member of their congregation. He delivered the gifts to Paul, and, re and he remained with Paul for a good bit of time there until he himself got sick. And he almost died, the, the letter tells us. And so Paul also learned from Epaphroditus some of the problems that the Philippian church was having. And one in particular was there was these two ladies that were fighting. Now this story and this sermon is not about two women fighting. Let's get that clear up front. It could have been two men that were arguing about something. There's plenty of that to go around too, isn't there? But evidently these two ladies were at swords points. I mean, they were having some trouble in... Epaphroditus told Paul about it, and you got to put yourself in Paul's position. Here he is in bonds, in prison, and he's dealing with this man about a church that he loved, by the way. It was one of the very first places that he established a small church group. This, unlike any of the other church groups, didn't have the problems like other groups like the Corinthian church where he had to deal with major problems, where he had to deal with doctrinal issues. Philippi was one of those churches that he loved. It was sort of easygoing, and they loved him. They appreciated him. They cared for him. They were concerned about him. So in his distress upon hearing, in their, I should say, the people of Philippi, in their distress upon hearing about Epaphroditus' near-death experience, they became upset and they became distressed and they wanted to know what was happening. So Paul writes this letter and he sends Epaphroditus back to Philippi, not only to assure them of their distress, but even Epaphroditus was worried about his own congregation and what they were going through, knowing that he almost died and he wanted to get back. But all of that was on top of what Paul was having to deal with. I mean, here's the man in bonds, 
And he's having to de still deal with church problems, wasn't he? And all of this, you know, drama, I guess, surrounding these events and, the, and what was going on. So his purpose for writing this letter was first to thank them for the little gift package, that's the money and the things that they sent him. I don't know what they sent him. Maybe they sent him some clothes. I mean, what would you send somebody in prison? Money, maybe some clothing, maybe a jar of jam, some foods or whatever. And he received those and he wanted to thank them for it. But he also wanted to address some secondary issues he wanted to tell them about his current condition because, believe me, they thought he was in a Roman prison and they didn't know what to expect. So he wanted to set their mind at ease about his conditions in prison. He also wanted, to, as I said, to send Epaphroditus home. He wanted to address the discord between the two women, and you'll like the way he goes about it. We're going to get to that in a moment. But he also wanted to warn them about enemies without, you know, that are in and around the church and to give them general encouragement. So we begin in chapter 1 of Philippians, the first chapter. It says, Paul and Timothy, the servant of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with bishops and deacons. As I said, this group had grown to be quite a, a, a nice little church group. Grace be unto you and peace to, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making requests with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, as I said, ten long years, Paul had a special place in his heart for this group at Philippi. He loved that group. <coughs> Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, uh, in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I wrote in my margin here, we're all waiting for that day, aren't we? I watched a, a program the other night, a movie, and I like to, my, I don't know if your digital movies have this ability where you can click over while you're watching the movie and it'll tell you about all the cast members. And it'll tell you their name and where they're from and what day they were born and if and when they died, the date. I like to scroll through that because I like to watch these old movies and realize they're all dead. Every single one of them are dead. Even the director, the sound guy, the guy that did the casting, the makeup, they're all gone. And yet movies have a way of preserving the life of an individual, doesn't it, when you look at it? There was another show that we watched, Judy and I, back when we first got married. It was a series. And I looked at this uh, little uh, expose of all the cast members on there, and I was just blown away at how many of them were gone. It was sad to me to know that these characters that I sort of fell in love with watching this series were mostly gone now. Only a few of them left out of all of those, all of those uh, programs. We're all, in a way, waiting for that moment when Jesus arrives. Some people's lives didn't last long enough to see that day in, while they lived. He says, he goes on to say, Even it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, insomuch as both in my bonds and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace." For God is my record, how greatly I longed after you all in the, bowels, uh, in the bowels of Jesus Christ. He had this affection and he had this desire to eventually go back to Philippi and visit those folks again. And, th and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in, in knowledge and in all judgment, discernment, if you will, that you may approve things that are excellent. I underline that in my Bible. Approve things that are excellent that you may be sincerely and without offense till the day of Christ. Again, that's the objective. That's the goal. That's the, the ultimate destination for all Christians. Being filled with fruits and righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. But I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furthering, furtherance of the gospel. Now, here he begins to explain to them. Yes, I know I'm in bonds. Yes, I know I'm in a Roman prison. 
But these things happened to me so that the gospel might be furthered. It wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't what I expected. He's going to go on to tell us that here in a moment. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. In other words, he was in bonds here, but it gave him the opportunity to preach the gospel unto the household of Caesar. The royal household of Caesar. He was able to preach the gospel because he was a prisoner and many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident in my, by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So there were Roman citizens who were actually going out and preaching the gospel. That's hard to believe, isn't it? You wouldn't think that. But he had preached the gospel enough that some of these Roman citizens had become converts, and they too began to preach. Some indeed preached Christ even of envy and strife, and some of goodwill. There were some that were glad Paul was in prison because it gave them the opportunity to have the limelight. You know what, though? Paul realized it didn't really matter, even though their motives may have been wrong. Even some of these people had selfish ambitions to be a preacher. Now that Paul's out of the way, I can step in and really make my name known. Paul realized even those people who had wrong ambitions selfish ambitions were still preaching the gospel he accepted that in a way look what he says the one preaches christ of contention not sincere purposing to add affliction to my bonds it was painful for him to watch that but the other of love knowing that i am set for the defense of the gospel there were those that did preach out of love which should have been their motivation what then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. I've always said that I know there's a, you know, if all you got to do is get on television and look or get on the radio and listen to some preachers. And I mean, you can tell they're so full of themselves, you can't hardly stand to watch. But if they are reading from the Word of God, if they're preaching from the Word of God, Sometime, in some ways, there are people out there who get that nugget of gold from what the Word of God says. Not from that guy, but it is from God himself, from the preaching of the gospel message through the Word of God. And maybe the people can overlook the arrogance and the faults of the person that is presenting the material. I mean, that's what Paul seems to be indicating here. He said, I then do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice, because he knew that the gospel message was being preached. Uh, down in verse 18, what the, uh, let's see, I read that uh, down in verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and, and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I believe Paul eventually thought that he would get out of prison as a result of their prayer. We don't know. There is those that believe that he was martyred in Rome. There are some writers that say that he eventually got out of, out of prison, but I don't see any evidence of that myself. I, I, I seem to think that he was martyred there eventually at Rome. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that we, with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether it be by life or death. And he makes this determination here. Whether I die or whether I live, Christ is going to be magnified. And look what he says. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But then he says, I don't know which one to choose. I don't know which one is better. But if I live in the flesh, this is the tr fruit of my labor. In other words, if I, keep, uh, if I stay alive, I can keep preaching the gospel message. Yet what, sh what shall, uh, but what I shall choose, I don't know. For I am in a strait betwixt the two. I don't know which decision to make, which is the better. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Staying here in the flesh is more needful for the group, for the church, for the preaching of the gospel. And so he felt compelled to stay here in the flesh and not push for his own execution by a Roman soldier. 
And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. You know, Paul, he had a attitude of personal sacrifice for the church that went above and beyond most of his contemporaries, didn't he? He even admitted that at one time. I, I don't think Paul was really that self-righteous because over and over again he said, you know, he would say, I'm not really worthy to have borne the calling that God had given me because I persecuted the church. I'm the least of the apostles, he would say. I'm the worst. I'm the worst choice. And yet God chose me to be in the ministry. That was Paul's attitude. But it was one of personal sacrifice for the work of God. That your rejoicing may be abundant in Christ Jesus for me, for me by my coming to you again. I believe that Paul thought he would eventually get out of prison and go see them again. Only let your conduct be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. I like that. I think that ought to be a church motto for every local congregation in our groups. Let your conduct be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. What a good motto to have. Listen to these words of Paul. You know, there's an expected level of conduct that should be exhibited by a church group. Now, that's whether it's, you know, the way you dress, the way you carry yourself, your attitude, your willingness to serve, the humility that you have, the good behavior to do things orderly, not trying to outdo one another, not to, trying to be judgmental, not condemning, but forgiving. And all of those should be done out of love, right? That was what Paul's message was. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. For Look at verse 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. He gives two he gives evidence or two points here that prove that you're that what we're doing is from God. And you know what they are? Is your church group of God? Here's the evidence that he gives. It is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him. In other words, we have God's Holy Spirit and we believe in Jesus Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. This church group was suffering somewhat. And he said, that's almost assuredly the evidence that you are a true church of God if you suffer some things, proofs of that, that it is from God. Having the same conflict which you, you saw in me and now here to, uh, to be in me. And of course, they witnessed the first time he came to Philippi when he was beaten and thrown into prison. You know, he's saying, remember when we first met, what happened to me when I started preaching the gospel? I was thrown in prison. I was beaten and thrown in prison. So he's reminding them of their, I guess, their history. Chapter 2 and verse 1, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship in, of the Spirit, I like that word fellowship that he uses here. Any bowels of mercy fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. In other words, have the same values, the same goals. Like a, you know, maybe like a, I, I like to use the, the analogy of a, of a sports team. They're all going in the same direction or an army that's going in the same direction with the same goal and the same objective in mind. Don't use partiality. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, letting, let each esteem other better than themselves. No selfish ambitions like some of these preachers he was talking about. And I guess this one's probably the hardest one of all, isn't it? Esteeming others better than yourself. You know what I noticed when I was reading this letter? When Epaphroditus told him about the problem that was going on in that church and that it was between these two ladies who were having a conflict. Paul didn't get his pen out and go right to the problem and say, you two ladies need to straighten out this problem. Notice his style. He, he sort of lays out what a church group should be composed of, love, long-suffering, 
you know, honoring one another, giving and thinking more of the other person than you do. He lays all of this out as a sort of a, a foundation or a groundwork before he even addresses the problem. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Uh Uh-oh. Now he uses the ultimate example. He said, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Who, look at this example he uses, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation. The Greek word here is kenosis. My margin, I'm going to read what my margin says about this. Kenosis, the Greek word for emptying, is related to the verb translated here as made himself of no reputation, which literally means he emptied himself. He had this glorified state, which he lived with the Father before he came to this earth. And he just let all of that go. And my margin says that he veiled his glory. He, he didn't come to this earth with all of his badges and all of his crowns and all of his glorified state. He came as a man and he sort of hid all of, you know, most people want to show all of their, you know, all of their, all of their accolades and all the things they've done and the awards they've made and won and the trophies they have. They've got them in a showcase over here. That's not what Jesus did. He emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation. He veiled his glory, taking on the, his, himself a true but sinless human nature, and he voluntarily submitted himself to the will of the Father. Good description. So now he's telling this group that Jesus made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and it was made in the likeness of men. I guess... That shamed them a little bit, wouldn't you think? It would have me. You know, to be reminded that we're to be in the likeness of Christ who gave everything up for us, for for our congregation. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the, of the stake. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So what was the reward? Well, he got the greatest honor that is, is imaginable. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is, the, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he got the highest honor because of what he did of showing himself to be completely humble. In the next part of this, he, he tells them to basically to let their light shine. As Jesus said in Matthew, the fifth chapter, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine. And he uses that example here. Look at verse 15. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. You know, we live in a, <laughs> I guess if we had to describe our world, world today, we'd have to say we live in a, in a crooked and perverse generation, don't we? We live in a nation that, is, that has lots of problems. It has lots of sins in it. Uh, but we're to, you know, we're to take on this likeness of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and like Paul described even Timothy, he said, I'm going to send Timothy unto you. He's the only person that I know that is like-minded. Look at verse 20. For I have no man like-minded who, is, who, has, who will naturally care for your state. Timothy was a real humble guy. You know, I did a sermon one time on the life of Timothy. And out of all the instances where Paul mentions Timothy, the places they went together, we have not one quote from Timothy, do we? Not one word. That's to me, it says volumes that the man was very humble. He was, he was a lowly guy. He was, but he was dedicated and he was loyal. And Paul sent him to this church group. He went and he took care of that church. He wasn't about his own selfish ambitions. And of course, he goes on to describe how Epaphroditus was sick unto death. And 
Paul wanted to encourage them that he was sending him back. Chapter 3, he tells them to press toward the mark. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same thing to you, to me indeed, and not be grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. I'm going to take a time out here because I guess a dog in those days was one of the most despicable animals. I mean, they just roamed up and down the streets and they ate out of the refuge and the garbage heaps. And so to compare somebody to a dog was a derogatory, extremely derogatory remark. You know, they called Christians dogs. Well, Paul is sort of throwing this back at not just the Jews, but the Judaizers. These were people that were going around from church group to church group. And, you know, as Paul said in the book of Acts, they stated that if a person was not circumcised, he couldn't be saved. Blanket statement. So Paul had to address that, and he said, circumcision was a physical act to a physical nation that God gave to Moses for the nation of Israel. It basically didn't have anything to do with salvation because salvation would come through Jesus Christ. So Paul had to deal with this on a number of occasions. They would come into a small group and say, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. And these Gentiles, Paul had already preached the gospel. They had been baptized and he told them they had salvation. And yet here comes these Judaizers right behind him telling the people that they couldn't be saved unless they were circumcised. Look what Paul calls them. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. You notice he doesn't use the word uh, circumcision here. On several occasions, Paul uses the adjective circumcision to describe those that were Israelites, that were Christians. Those of the circumcision, those that are not of the circumcision. He meant Jews and Gentiles. He called Peter and they would preach to the circumcision. I have been selected to preach to the Gentiles. He used those terms liberally throughout his writings. But he uses this term concision. You know what that means? It means mutilators. He called them mutilators or cutters. But look what he says in verse 3. For we are the circumcision, not them, but us, those Christians, you Gentiles. We are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. He knew that that was a physical act that could never bring about salvation, but that, you know, in another place in Romans, the second chapter, remember he says, he is not a Jew that is one outwardly and of the flesh, but he is a Jew that is one inwardly and circumcision is of the heart. Even those Gentiles, if they were had that circumcision of the heart, could have God's spirit and have salvation and never be physically circumcised. Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I the more. In other words, if you want to talk about fleshly credentials, let's put all that aside and let's talk about that. Let's let's talk about bragging rights here. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. He said, I was of the stock of Israel, a tribe of Benjamin, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In touching the law, I was a Pharisee. You can't get any higher than that. I mean, I was right there in the, in the top level of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Concerning zeal, you want to talk about zeal? Well, I persecuted the church. I went out and hailed people to jail and maybe put some of them to death. And touching righteousness that is in the law, I was blameless. So if you want to compare notes, I've already done it all. But look what he says. But what things were gained to me? What were they? What was his gain? He had power. He had prestige. He probably had a good income. He had status in his society. He was up there with the top echelon. He was talking. He was eating at the big, at the grown-ups table, wasn't he? He says, I counted loss for Christ. Personally, those things were an advantage, but I lost them all for Christ. The thing about it is, 
Paul realized that having lost all of those things actually brought him closer to God. He realized that, and he wrote to the Philippians and told them, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things. He lost his home. He lost his country. He lost his position. He lost his income. He lost his friends. He lost his job. He lost security. He lost his freedom. But he gained the excellency of Jesus Christ. And I do count them but dung. Wow, that I may win Christ. What a, <laughs> what a humble, profound attitude for a man to have, having gone through all of this. And be found him in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, that the righteousness which is of God is by faith. He realized that it was Christ who was righteous, not me. Christ was the one that was righteous. And my faith in him makes me righteous because I believe in him. And I believe that he died for my sins. And therefore, I became clean before God. It wasn't my actions. It was Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's what he's saying. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead... Not as though I already attained. In other words, I didn't, I'm not already there. I haven't arrived spiritually yet, but I have experienced some things since my conversion. Either we're already perfect, but I followed after if that I apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but these But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. He could have laid in that jail cell and wallowed in pity about all the things that he had lost. And he could have been sorry for himself about all the choices I could have made, and yet I ended up here. And reaching forth unto those things which are before, looking ahead, looking to the future. That's what he was telling this Philippian church. Forget all of those things that are behind. All the failures, all the sins, the faults that we might have that burden us. And all the accomplishments and the credentials, I guess, in Paul's case. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many be perfect, be thus minded, and if any thing uh, ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we are already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. In other words, be spiritually minded together. I want to skip down to uh, chapter 4. We'll, we'll wrap it up here. Chapter 4, he waits until now to name these two ladies. He said, therefore, my brother, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Now look at how he gently deals with this. I beseech Eurodia and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Now this is a letter that these two ladies were sitting in the congregation. Probably this letter might have been read out loud in the church group. They heard all of this up to here, and they, they were probably attentive and listening and bright-eyed and hearing the letter, hearing this word from Paul, and then all of a sudden, they're mentioned by name. You think that was a little, you think a little embarrassment might happen, a little red face? But Paul does it so gently, he says, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. He didn't say they're cast out, kick them out, we're tired of hearing their griping or whatever their faults were. No, he said their names were written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Down in verse 8 he says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. 
What a, what a great letter. Man, what a great letter. And finally, the final verse is down in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think it's an encouraging letter. It is in this short letter. Uh, it is a short letter, I should, should say. But it's full of great advice and instructions straight from the Apostle Paul. When you remember that he was dealing with problems while he was in prison, I guess it's all the more poignant, isn't it? It is also very humbling to know that he was under a great deal of stress, and yet he still had to deal with the problems of local congregations. And yet he loved that group, and he was very fond of its members. He knew them all by name. And I think Paul often thought of that group and wished that he could somehow go visit them and see them personally again. But circumstances would not allow that to happen. For even in his current situation, the power of God and the preaching of the gospel was made known. He encouraged this local group, as we should today, to stay close to God, to be in harmony with one another, to let love be our motivation, to be unified in our efforts, and to remain faithful under the second coming of Christ, a moment for which we are all waiting.